Welcome to Red, White and Blue. I'm Gary Pollan from the right. And I'm Dallas Jones from the left. This week on Red, White and Blue, we're going to do a spring primary preview, Dallas. We're going to find out what's happening in both parties. Uh, another exciting election season. And uh, to be fair, people should know you and I are involved in politics. <laughs> Who would have thought? I know. I mean, it's just like unbelievable. We're not journalists. Uh, and we both are very active in a number of races that will be in the, on the spring primary. Absolutely. So the, the opinions expressed by me and Gary Pollard are, are our opinions and our opinions only. This is our overall disclaimer. Okay. <laughs> now, now that we got that out of the way, we have two guests. All right, house cleaning. Yeah, house cleaning. Two guests uh, and two very important guests. Uh, first, I want to do ladies first. Please. Um, Lily Schechter is chairman of the Harris County Democratic Party and uh, is one of the most successful Democratic, Harris County Democratic chairman in the last 30 years. <laughs> Probably chair, the chair most women. successful chairwoman chair or chairperson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm chair not person. sure how you all put it. I'm not politically correct. <laughs> you all, correct. that would be us. Yeah, politically mm -hmm. correct. <laughs> anyway, the most successful uh, Democratic chairman in the last three decades. So uh, congratulations to you, Lily. We're excited you came on today. And we have Matt Mikowiak. Matt is chairman of the Travis County Republican Party, but that's just one hat that he wears. He also publishes a daily newsletter about politics, which is quite fascinating. And if you don't read it, Lily, you ought to. It's really good. And also is a political consultant. Uh, Dallas, so you may be able to put a deal together here. Well, we'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Dallas, you go first. Well, um, there are a lot of races on the ballot. This is a, it's, it's a, it's a very interesting um, primary season that we're seeing shape up, um, particularly here in Harris County and the southeast region. Um, my question, um, and either one of you can take this, what, what we've seen here is that um, we have more Democrats uh, running for office in the Democratic primary, probably than we do ha than we have Republican opponents. Um, you know, I'd like to get both of you all's take on that um, from the Republican perspective and from um, what's happening in the Democratic Party perspective as well. So, wh whoever would like to take that one, I'll just jump in and say, at the Harris County Democratic Party, we are thrilled that we have so many competitive primaries. It is exciting. Primaries are an opportunity for every voter and every candidate to really get engaged in the process and hear what each candidate stands for and really to have a discussion about what, what it means to be a Democrat and what are our values as the Democratic Party. So we have over 50 competitive primaries in Harris County, which is incredible. Yeah, I mean, I would just say um, the central question to me looking at the Republican and Democratic primary, really looking at the general election in, in November 2020 is, is 2020 going to look like 2018 or is it going to look like 2016? And if you just look historically, presidential election cycles are generally pretty similar in terms of the people that turn out. People, so there are voters who only turn out in presidential years because they think the presidential election is the one that matters most, that affects them most. It's actually quite the opposite. Local elections off, oftentimes affect people more directly than the national elections do. Uh, but I think midterm elections have a lot more variability. And you saw in 2018 the Beto wave, $80 million raised and spent. No person who's ever run for United States Senate, challenger or incumbent, has raised that much money for U.S. US Senate. I think he spent seven, eight, $78 and a half million million of that. And he put it in into Texas. And it benefited Democrats down ballot. They brought a million voters, uh, new voters out. And they had that combined with straight ticket voting in a way that, that, that because the margin for U.S. Senate was 2.6%, he dragged a number of Democrats over the line down ballot. So my, my own view is I think 2020 is going to look more like 2016, not more like 2018. The Democrats are betting it's going to look like a continuation of 2018. That's why you're seeing so much enthusiasm for them uh, recruiting candidates to run for, race, run, for, run for specific seats. Republicans are trying to take those seats back that Democrats won in 2018. That would be, you're talking about congressional races. Up and down ballot, up and down ballot. You've Except in Harris County. Right? Yeah, I mean. You, Harris County looks like 2016. That's a great day in Harris County for Democrats. It, it, 18 yes. would be amazing for us, but 16 we won also. So very well, excited and, about and, and, there, and there was no Beto in 2016, 16, right? right? We and did it so, without a top of the ticket. And where, where things stand today, the Democrats have already won a, a lot of those down ballot races because the Republican Party in Harris County didn't bother to put up a candidate. So those yeah. races are over. It doesn't matter what happens. Well, They're going to have a good year. It won't make, it, whether it's a good year or a great year depends on what's going to happen going forward. Yeah, I think if you look at the statewide map on the on the Texas legislature, we know that there are 25 or 30 state house seats that are in play. The Democrats have flipped 17 seats in the last two elections, 12 in 2018, 5 in 2016, and they're now nine seats from taking the majority back in the Texas House. Uh, that matters for a couple reasons. Number one, the Abbott-Patrick agenda of 
uh, elected Republicans in Austin would be pretty much dead if Democrats controlled the House. They elected their own speaker. Uh, they would have to have bipartisan support to move things. Number two, and perhaps more importantly long term, is you're going to have new maps drawn. And generally, the House maps are drawn by the House. The Senate maps are drawn by the Senate. Congressional maps are generally signed off on by the delegation at the congressional level. So you're going to lock in maps for 10 years based on what happens in November of 2020 at the Texas House, Texas Senate, and, and U.S. House level, and that's going to have huge ramifications for the next decade of politics in Texas. But while we, while we, we, we have this discussion, there's still a, a huge question, which is why was it in, in 2018 and even more so today that Texas is being looked at on the national level as potentially finally flipping from what it currently is, which is purple, to blue. Yeah, I mean, I would just, I would just say, I don't think but Texas. I know who you're asking. Yeah. <laughs> hey, anybody who wants to jump yeah, in here. I'm right? sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say that that clearly, um, Beto narrowing the statewide margin to 2.6 percent has given Democrats a lot of motivation and belief. I want to set something straight Please. really quick. Beto O'Rourke was an amazing candidate in 2018. He did not do this alone. It is about the work that's being done here in Texas statewide for the last 10 years. He had a great year. He didn't carry every county. Some Democrats carried counties that he didn't. He had a great year. He infused a lot of money into the political process. That part was amazing. But a lot of people also came out because they were voting against the administration at the time, not just for Beto or Work. And we've been doing, Dallas and I have been doing this work on the ground in Harris County for the last 10 years, registering voters and turning them out to vote. So the trajectory for Texas is not just because Beto O'Rourke ran in 2018, it's also because we've been, we've been registering people to vote, our population is on the uptick, and the majority of people moving to Texas are uh, people of color, and that changes the entire electorate. Well, I was waiting for you to jump in. Sorry. Right you, you have to say that, not me. Go ahead, Gary. Well, I, I, I was going to bring it local at this point. because One of the things I find fascinating uh, is the challenges at the Harris County level for the tax assessor collector, for county attorney, for district attorney, for county commissioner in Precinct 1, where Maria Jackson's taken on Rodney Ellis, 34-year incumbent, are, are interesting races and, and seem, seem on their face to be competitive. Though one of the, the common denominators, at least that I've seen from talking to my Democratic friends, are all those incumbents, that is the district attorney, the county attorney, the tax assessor, have a challenger basically that was sponsored by Rodney Ellis or put forward by Rodney whoa, Ellis. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's oh, an that is very, I, I, I'm ludicrous. telling you what my friends have said. Okay. All my right. Democratic I, friends. I, am I your friend? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're my TV buddy. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying that, that they say he's behind it. And, and he's got, and he's going to have, I, I think believe. you're giving him a lot of credit. Well, uh, I, I think it's deserved. And there are people that say that the opponents that he and others have, that there's other people behind it. There's always going to be political right. rumors. Well, and I think his race in of itself is fascinating. Fascinating, because he hadn't had a real race in 30 years, and so he's going to be—he's challenged by someone who's well qualified, bright, uh, pioneering Democratic judge who got elected before, uh, mm -hmm. early on. So uh, I think it'll be a fascinating race to see how that works. And again, last year in, in Harris County, it was a year of the African American woman. That was, that was part of the Democratic campaign, Judges. which was smart. Oh, mm -hmm. absolutely! And we elected a whole slew of, of Democratic women to the bench. And I, I'm, I'm wondering how this will play in the Democratic primary this year in that race. It'll be, it's one I'm watching. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. We're looking at turnout numbers that could exceed 500,000 and reach up to 600,000 people voting in our primary. That is a lot of people voting in a Democratic primary. Our registration numbers are up so much okay. that we know they're going to have, we are going to have um, higher turnout than 2008, which is our last huge primary. Just by sheer registration alone, we'll have a bigger turnout than 2008. And, uh, to, Matt, to, to tell you what, what ha you know what happens? Big turnout in the primary means that the new voters who turn out and vote Democratic end up on uh, Ms. Schechter's list of Democrats to reach out to that before may not have been reached. You know, absolutely. You, you always want higher turnout in a primary. Of course, 2008 was an unusual year. You had, uh, there was an open seat race for the White House. You had interest on both sides. We don't really know how to measure the, the Operation Chaos effort that Rush Limbaugh tried to push Republicans into the Democratic primary. That would have accounted for some of that. Uh, in fact, we have a Republican congressional candidate who says that he, he voted yes. the Democratic primary for that purpose. Mm -hmm. So setting that aside, uh, but yeah, I think we are expecting turnout to be high. There is a lot of action up and down ballot. You talk about the DA race. You have uh, you know a, a more left-wing candidate challenging the incumbent who's been endorsed by Texas Organizing Project. So 
one of the three le more left-leaning uh, challengers. Yes, that's four right. People and, in and, that room. and could go to a runoff right, with 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 much lower turnout. And I do think that's one of the other dynamics to watch, both in Houston and Harris County, but also even across the state. And that is, Texas Democratic primaries are becoming more hotly contested, more competitive, more interesting. In the last few cycles, it's been Republican primaries, purity tests, moving people to the right. You're seeing that on the Democratic side, and that may lead to nominees who can't get elected in swing seats across the state. We'll see how it plays out. Well, but again, taking it back local, I, I mean, I think it's great for us to sit here and have these conversations and, and talk about rumors and, and things of that nature. But, you know, to Lily's point, we, we have seen a consistent growth in Harris County um, by the Democratic Party long before Beto O'Rourke. I mean, you talk about 08. 08, we all look at as consultants as an outlier year. Sure. Right? It was this national uh, 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 excitement that happened, and we saw record numbers of turnout. You know, my point would be, I think we're going to see that again, and particularly in this county that has proven itself over the last uh, election cycles to, to actually trend blue. I think we're going to see that no matter who the nominee is um, on the Democratic side. I think what's on the ballot, and we should all be honest about it, is President Trump. And I think for the first time since his election, the American people are going to get an opportunity to come and really get beyond the polls, get beyond the spin, get beyond the rhetoric, and actually let the country and, ev and the world know what we actually think about this president. Would you agree with that? Well, sure. I mean, this is a, a meaningful election. You can see that there's going to be a sharp difference in the directions the Democrats are going to offer and what Trump is going to offer. Um, I do think top of the ballot matters. Uh, to, just to counter what she said earlier, it matters because you had straight ticket voting in 2018. Okay, so Beto closing the gap from a what should have been a 9 or 10 or 11 point loss to 2.6% means a lot of down-ballot Democrats won votes they didn't earn. They won, they won them through straight-ticket voting. That is not going to be in place in 2020. So the net effect of that is you are going to have a lot of people turn out to vote for the presidential election who then don't vote down-ballot, or maybe they vote for different parties. We were talking about judicial races earlier. You might see some Republicans vote for Democratic incumbents or vice versa. So my point is this is going to be a very highly variable election year. You're going to have some surprising results, I think. Let's, uh, let's move to the, 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 what will take suck up all the oxygen in the next few weeks, and that's going to be the presidential primary on the Democratic side, because I don't think this, but, but Trump has a couple of no. minor opponents, but it's like it's not of interest. So the Democrats have a, a, a lot of candidates, not as many as they not used as many to. As no. We're down to what four that are that'll make the final six. Six. I who? think we're down to Let's six. So who are your final six? I mean, our final six candidates are Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, uh, Amy Klobuchar, uh, Buttigieg, uh, Pete Buttigieg, and Bloomberg. Um, Bloomberg. 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 Bloomberg would be also, six. Yang is still in the game. Tom Steyer and still Tom in the Steyer game and also. Bloomberg aren't even on the well. Steyer is still in the game, but Bloomberg isn't even bothering with the debate spade, uh, stage and spending more money than all of them. He's yeah. going to be on the ballot in Texas, though, mm -hmm. isn't he? Mm -hmm. He Bloomberg. is, and he's and he's polling higher than yeah. some of them who have been on the ballot for quite some time. I yeah, mean, he's, he's formidable. Yeah, his commercials. I, I don't <laughs> know if y'all watched the Texans game the other day. It was a back-to-back -back commercials that he did, and Absolutely. they were good commercials. Oh, absolutely. yeah, no, the commercials are, are some of the best I've seen. Yeah. So. Absolutely. And so as that, I, I think as that excitement, as people's candidates, you know, I, I, I will be honest, I, I initially, <laughs> out the bat, I, I was a supporting S Senator Kamala Harris. She's gone, you yeah. know, and so I'm, I'm like a lost deer in the, in the forest <laughs> trying to figure out where does my support go now, and I still haven't figured that out. And I would, I would argue that there's probably a lot of that. And Lily, I you? haven't figured out. I was uh, uh, Harris and then... Uh, Castro and so now I'm and then I was Booker <laughs> and so now I'm trying to figure out who I'm gonna vote for right I think it's interesting on the Democratic side uh, there's a couple things that are interesting number one the Texas primary is gonna matter and it's gonna matter Absolutely. it's gonna millions. matter because can we get you on tape saying that? <laughs> well one of the reasons that it's gonna one of the reasons it's gonna matter I think <laughs> Sorry, is okay. unless and as we sit here we obviously don't know how Iowa and New Hampshire are gonna turn out um, we can probably guess there's a two or three scenarios that are more likely than others but more than likely, Super Tuesday is going to be really important. And first of all, no one has ever skipped the first four states, the early states, and then fully funded Super Tuesday. No one's ever tried that strategy. So predictions about Mike Bloomberg, I think, are not worth very much. Um, he, as you said, he's already spent more money than everyone else combined, and that includes Steyer, who's a billionaire. Um, I think the second thing that's really interesting is the Democrats, their presidential primary is very different than the Republicans. Republicans are winner-take-all. Winner-take-all is how we got Trump. Trump had a high floor and a low ceiling. 
He got the advantage of the high floor, never paid the cost of the low ceiling. He was able to win the lion's share of delegates in a lot of places with 42 or 45 percent of the vote. The Democrats, conversely, are uh, give, give, give away de delegates uh, proportionally. Inclusive. And that's, Right. Well, what's it, it's <laughs> what, what it what it means is what what it what it means is that no one the convention. It's much harder to build up a huge it's lead, fine. and if you have four or six candidates that are amassing delegates going forward, and which you're going to have on Super Tuesday in California and Texas and other places, I, I think the Democratic primary is going to go till May, maybe all the way to the convention. It's entirely fight. possible. So is that a good thing or a bad thing for President Trump? Um, I think it helps Trump in the sense that it gives him an advantage uh, organizationally and financially. Democrats are going to unify, and when they do, that person is going to get a huge amount of money and help. But they want that to happen sooner, not later. Uh, there's a cost to having an intra-party battle. Right now you're having the left and the middle sort of fight with each other about who, who can beat Trump and who has the best ideas. That, yeah. that obviously leads to some division. Now, there will be a unification. There is absolutely going to be a unification. Just being around activists every single day, people have their favorites and they prioritize them their first you know, two, three, four, five. Every time I go to a meeting and to an event, the conversation turns to, it doesn't matter who, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. who has our nominee. It does not matter. It's anybody but Trump. Okay, well, how does that fit with the Republicans? Does it matter who the Democrats nominate? It does. It matters, and it's going to matter here in Texas, too. Um, you know, I, I think, from my standpoint, I think Biden and Klobuchar present real challenges if they're the nominee in Texas, in the suburbs, in the swing districts, in the swing parts uh, of the state. If it's more of a Warren or Sanders type of candidacy, that's more far left. That's anti-energy. That's tax increases. That's government control of health care. Those things are not going to work, I don't think, in the suburbs. And that's going to give Trump a chance to make it a choice election. Democrats want to make it a referendum. Uh, Biden or Klobuchar, to me, are the kind of candidates that I don't think can win Texas, but they can narrow the margin enough that it can help them, you know, preserve their gains in the Texas House, if not take the Texas House back, preserve their gains in the, in the U.S. House, the two seats that they held, maybe they can hold them still or pick up an additional seat. So, yeah, the identity and the platform of the Democratic presidential nominee is going to matter to a great extent in Texas. But to be, but to be fair, if there, if there were two of the, the candidates in the primary that could win Texas, it would certainly, I think, at this point, be Biden and, and Klobuchar just because of well, their I position on a number of issues. there's been six recent polls that say that Trump either is in a dead heat or loses Texas to any Democrat right now. That, I mean, for whatever polls are worth, there have been six recently that have said Trump is not doing well in Texas. Does the impeachment matter in all of this? Can, can I just say one thing to that before? Sure, then I we mean, can answer that. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, remember, Trump won Texas by 9% in 2016, right? So to believe the polls that, that she's citing, which she's correct, the polls that we've seen have shown Democrats leading Trump by a few points to five or even as much as eight points. To believe that that's the case, you'd have to believe that there's a 15 or 17 point swing in Texas in the last three years. I just don't see evidence of that. Look, the impeachment question for me, uh, we know what the result's going to be. Uh, it's a question of process at this point. Uh, independents ha have really not gone one way or the other. The Democrats haven't really won the public argument to put political pressure on Republicans. I don't think impeachment is going to matter very much in November. It's going to be nine months in the rearview mirror at that point. This election is going to be about the economy, the direction of the country, a bit of a referendum on Trump, and a choice about the direction of the future of the country. All right. Yeah, we mentioned congressional races, so mm -hmm. we have a not, we have a few congressional races. Democrats are taking and challenging s certain Republicans. We have the big open seat. Is that CD21 where there's like a thousand people running? There's two in West Texas yeah. that have, have very yeah. large fields. Yeah. Yeah. This one we have is the Fort Bend County, basically the Fort Bend County seat. But oh, 22. Yeah. It's 22. 22. Mm -hmm. Huge, huge crowds on both sides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's exciting uh, to see so many good candidates running. It'll be interesting to see who actually emerges. There'll probably be runoffs in both. And then we have, uh, uh, you have local C CD7. CD2, CD14, which are, we have incumbent Lizzie Fletcher, who beat Culberson, who, by the way, never moved back to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, but she's got, she's got some formidable opponents. In that race, do you have any handicap? I mean, I know the minority leader has got a favorite, Wesley Hunt. Yeah, I mean, Wesley Hunt has had tremendous fundraising success um, and just truly extraordinary, among the best of any, you know, challenge, Republican challengers. Uh, there is a female mayor of, of former Mayor of Bel Air named Cindy Siegel who's running, who I think is a strong former candidate. Former vice chair of the Republican Party in Harris County also. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So she has a, a good network. Whether she can 
kind of increase her fundraising to really compete with West Hunt remains to be seen. But so that may go to runoff as well. I mean, these primary these primary fields that that field's not as large. Some of these fields are really large, like the 22 field. I, th well. I think has 15 candidates in it, <laughs> and I think there's probably four candidates who have a chance to get in the runoff. Who, who? Pierce Bush being one. There's a county sheriff in Fort Bend named Troy Nels who has a good chance of a judge named a former judge named Greg Hill. What about uh, Kathleen Wall? She's Kathleen spending Wall, money who's like crazy. She spent money like crazy last time, too, and got her nowhere. Yeah. She, I don't know if you remember, in 2018, she ran a lot of ads, had her with, um, I believe, a shotgun in her ad, and it was right around the time of another mass shooting, and right. people just rejected her handily on the ballot. On the Republican, on the Republican, Republican primary, side, right. for sure. There, there will be residual benefit to advertising in the Houston media market, given that that district is in the media market. The problem is, is the voters in that district are not in the voters in the district she ran in before. So she'll have some residual name ID, but she's going to have to overcome that because she's running in a different district. Let me, let me uh, ask this question. I mean, we, we've gone and we've talked about the congressional races, but I mean, we, we clearly have a Senate seat up um, on this ballot as well. And um, particularly on the Democratic side, we have um, 11. 11. 11 candidates. Runoff coming. Um, <laughs> definitely a runoff coming, but 11 candidates vying for the U.S. Senate. How do you see that shaping up? I, you know, again, I think we are going to go to a runoff. I don't know predictions on that. There are so many good candidates in the race, and they all offer different um, values and different platforms. The problem is with impeachment going on, I think it's taken all the air. And in the presidential primaries, it's taken all the oxygen out of the air for those candidates. So you hear, I hear very little unless I see it on social media from them, and I like several of them a lot. I don't know if they've been able to travel the state enough to really penetrate and get past the noise of impeachment in the presidential primaries. I think it's a great point. I mean, I think that, first of all, I'd say, uh, and this will sound like an insult, but I don't think there's a first-tier candidate on the Democratic side running for U.S. Senate. Julian Castro's not running, Joaquin Castro's not running, Beto O'Rourke's not running. These are not proven statewide candidates. These are regional candidates. You have a state senator in Houston, you have a councilwoman in, uh, state senator in Dallas, councilwoman in Houston, a former Activist congressman in Houston, Austin. activist in Austin, a failed congressional candidate in Central Texas, up just north of Austin. I think those four, maybe there's a fifth somewhere who are probably- Former congressman also Yeah, Houston. I think there's probably four, maybe five people who can get in the runoff. But to me, these, are, these candidates are going to have to run regional strategies. They're not raising enough money to put up statewide television, which costs $1.8 million a week to have saturation level mm -hmm. television. So um, they're going to have a runoff, and I think that matters because Cornyn has $10 million in the bank already. Democrats aren't going to have yeah. a nominee until May, late May. That's a problem. And the other thing is Cornyn is not Cruz. I mean, Cruz was a, was a candidate. People love Ted Cruz or they hate Ted Cruz. So Beto was able to exploit the fact that there were a lot of folks that he didn't like Well, I think the more you like talk him. about Cornyn's record, the more people realize that, or Democrats do, that they actually do hate him. You just have to talk about his record. He's yeah, kind of so gone nice. under the it's radar to, for it's, it's, a while. It's hard yeah, but to he get votes mad at terribly every time. But well, it's interesting, Matt, offense. I wanna, I wanna push back because you talked about the money that, that John Cornyn had in the bank. Um, but, you know, we also, well, I mean, matter? does the money matter? I mean, uh, what, what are voters looking for these days? And, 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 you know, how much money is enough money to, to, make, to make a change in this race or, or, or any other? Well, I think at the statewide level, ma money matters a lot, right? Because you have to be able to, to deliver your Beto message. Beto outraised Cruz. No, yeah. that's right. But Cruz also raised, I think, 30 or $35 million. People forget money. that. It was, a, yeah. it was a lot of money. Cruz had advantages. It was a Republican state. He'd won statewide before. He was an incumbent. He had, so he had some sort of inherent advantages. That, that also, money... Abbott spent... Let's, let's not forget that Abbott spent a bunch of money also. 40, he yeah. did. 40, uh, yeah, 40, Abbott yeah. spent, spent a tremendous amount of money as well. So I agree with you, though. I think Cornyn's image among the general electorate is much better than Cruz's is. He and just so comes across as it's just not, nicer. It's, nicer. Cru, yeah, Cornyn is not the target, not the rich target the way Democrats thought Cruz was. And Be look, Beto ran a race that was based on personality. And he thought a p personality contrast with Cruz was advantageous to him, and it probably was. You're not going to be able to do that with Cornyn, I don't think. Now, one of the things you talked about, we talked about money and the importance of money in politics, but then you take a look at the media coverage, which, which I know we've talked about before. Uh, you look at these races, and some of these races, they get no coverage at all. I mean, the newspapers give them a couple inches, uh, never on local television at all. I mean, how do people get their information if they really want it? It's certainly not as easy as, as it used to be, I think. No, I think you really have to layer communication. You have to try to meet people, or meet people where they are, and you need to do text messaging. You need to do phone calls. You need to do door knocks. You need to do mail. You need to do digital ads. I mean, you have to do a little bit of everything to penetrate. You cannot just flood the markets, you know, flood the air with commercials nowadays because 
I haven't watched local TV, sorry, in a really <laughs> long time. Well, at least not on, on your DVR you may watch, but I you blow watch. through the commercials. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I, I think it's, it's interesting because there's kind of two ways to look at that. I agree with you that it is, it is harder now to earn media than it's ever been in terms of a mass media type of way. Um, you know, getting on local news in Houston is one of the hardest things to do in the Western Hemisphere. Well, unless right? you want to be in an auto accident. That's exactly right. Like they're that. covering traffic. They're covering crime. Victim. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. Disasters. I mean, it is yes. really hard to break through. You it are is. one member of Congress or challenging one member of Congress in one of the Houston congressional districts. Good luck. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the technological tools have also made it very easy to convey messages to very narrow sectors of the audience. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, email lists, texting, those are the tools of the future. Unfortunately, they're not enough. They're they are enough to be a supplemental way to, to, to deliver a message. They're not enough by itself. Television, radio, and mail are still the key. They're dwindling as an overall share of the way people receive news, but they're the key right now. Right, and, uh, and there's, there's, there are certain challenges that we'll have to overcome before these digital tools become Indeed. supreme, and particularly in communities of color, no, we where we have data deserts, we have yeah. people that have lack of access to the internet, lack of knowledge on how to use the internet, the internet, and particularly for Democratic Party, where you know African American women are such a huge part of our base, particularly older ones. Right, we're we're going to have to figure out how to bridge that technology in order to use that to get to and get to them. You can't discount direct voter contact. I mean, right. knocking on someone's door, calling them at their house is also incredibly important in ways to communicate with people. Well, look, we are so ecstatic that both of you were able to be with us here today on Red, White, and Blue. Um, Gary, it's always great to be here with you. Dallas, I couldn't do it without you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back next week for another episode. I'm Dallas Jones from the left. Gary Pollard from the right. And this is Red, White, and Blue.